What are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk today about how the apparent material properties of polymers changes depending on how quickly you deform them. So here I have two scraps of plastic. They're just made from, I just made them by cutting a bit of a plastic bag. For those of you who are interested in these are, these are made of low density polyethylene, the type of bags you get when you, you know, get, uh, get plastic bags from a grocery store or whatever. Um, so what am I going to do? I'm going to take one of these pieces of plastic and I'm going to try to deform it as slowly as possible, stretch it out until it breaks as going as slow as I possibly can. And then the other one, I'm going to go as fast as I possibly can. I'm going to, I'm going to tear it, tear it as quickly as I can. So, you know, this, this, this first one will take a minute, so feel free to fast forward. Um, but I'm, I'm just going to try to stretch it out as slow as I can. All right, there we go. So I stretched it out, and if you notice, it had a seriously uh, a lot of a lot of plastic deformation before before it finally snapped right here. In contrast, I'll break this one, and if you look at this one, this one basically had much less much less deformation before it uh, before it finally before it finally broke. So what's the key difference here? Well, depending on the rate at which you deform a polymer, you uh, different, um, different things are happening at the molecular level. And, uh, and you end up sort of observing different uh, macroscopic mechanical properties. For example, if we deform things slowly, we might experience a much larger strain before failure. If we deform things quickly, they might appear stiffer um, for the moment, uh, but uh, it takes a lot more um, uh, but but they sort of snap before they can, you know, fully stretch out and uh, and fracture at the very end. So, what's going you know what's going on here? Well, this phenomenon that we describe here with these two with these two pieces of plastic is what we call viscoplas viscoplasticity. Um, and that that will be some of what we'll talk about today. But actually, we'll also spend a fair fraction of today talking about viscoelasticity. And the key thing with viscoplasticity and viscoelasticity is the visco parts of it are basically uh, describing viscous phenomena, or essentially like the way we describe how fluids move. And plasticity is basically what happens after the yield stress or the yield strength. And elasticity is sort of what happens before the yield strength, before permanent deformation sets in. So, uh, and in both cases, you know, these plasticity and elasticity are solid-like phenomena, and the viscos are the fluid-like phenomena. And basically, when you have both fluid-like and solid-like characteristics, you end up with uh, you end up with stress-strain curves that appear to have a sort of rate dependence to them. So, you know, in the past, we've talked about the stress strain curve and different materials have different stress strain curves, even for something that is the same material, like, uh, like polyethylene that makes up these plastic bags, or these pieces of plastic bag, um, even for the same material, you might get a different stress strain curve depending on how quickly you tear apart the material. So basically, our first will be a, a, a brief discussion of viscoplasticity and sort of interpreting the stress strain curves and how it depends on strain rate. And then the second thing we're going to talk about is viscoelasticity, which is going to sort of be, uh, be the main topics that we'll discuss. We'll discuss what happens on the molecular level. And the key, the key difference between things that happen on the molecular level are what happens to cross-linked polymers. Versus non-cross-linked ones. 
and uh, sort of you know what's what's happening on the on the level of polymers and chains and deformation of the chains and uncoiling and things like that. So we'll sort of make connections between what's happening on the molecular level and some properties that we observe macroscopically. Then we'll move on to talking about two viscoelastic models. Of course, not being satisfied with what with just a qualitative description of what's happening at the molecular level. As engineers, we want to describe things quantitatively. And basically, the idea with these viscoelastic, viscoelastic models is we'll replace We'll replace the messy, the messy behavior of these things that kind of behave like solids and kind of behave like liquids. We'll replace the messy behavior with a simplified combo of springs, which will sort of capture the elastic part of the behavior, and dash pots which are basically these mechanical devices that, um, that sort of exemplify viscous behavior. So viscoelastic models will sort of put together springs and dash pots. And it turns out that we'll sort of be able to recapitulate both cross-linked polymers and non-cross-linked polymers to an approximation using, using these simplifications. It turns out that our sort of, there are two, uh, two viscoelastic models that um, uh, one works better for one, you know, one polymer type, the other works better for the other polymer type. Their names are Kelvin Voigt model and a Maxwell model. And with these two models, you can kind of recapitulate most of the behavior of what happens for uh, uh, for these for these two types of or two classes of viscoelastic materials. Uh, and then finally, at the end, we'll wrap it up with a description of two experiments. Right, okay, we can have a viscoelastic model, but unless we have a way to measure or characterize the parameters that go into that model, for example, like the stiffness of the springs, you know, the K, the spring constant, unless we have a way to sort of measure or, or recapitulate that behavior experimentally, you know, it's not gonna be that very, not, um, it's not gonna be that helpful to us. So we'll describe two experiment types to fit the models. And, uh, and what are those? The first one is going to be a creep test. Not just for all you Radiohead fans out there. Uh, but the second is going to be a stress relaxation test. Which seems like a pretty good way. Uh, it's, it's a bit of an oxymoron, right? Relaxation and test, stress and relaxation. Oh no, no. But but we'll we'll. Uh, I'm not just joking here. But this is a this is a quantitative, uh, a quantitative thing here. So stress relaxation tests basically um, examine how stress in the material changes with time, and that can allow us to sort of fit these uh, fit these models um, or fit parameters to these models here. And can I you know with with one or both of these tests can allow you to figure out you know. If I have some unknown polymer, you know, might it be cross-linked? Might it not? How might that change? So first, let's talk about stress-strain curves and how those stress-strain curves depend on strain rate. So with, viscoplas with, with viscoplasticity, um, we observe differences in the uh, stress-strain curve uh, for materials that depends on strain rate. So first, sketch what you think the stress strain curve for the piece of plastic that it deformed quickly might look like. And then after that, sketch, sketch the stress strain curve for the one where I deformed slowly. And just so you can uh, remind yourself you know, which one was which, the one that I deformed slowly is this piece right here. And the one that I deformed quickly is this one right here. So they, they started at the same, you know, with the same, uh, the same length, the same shape, etc. This one I would pull quickly. This one I pulled very slowly. Well, hopefully you've had a chance to pause and ponder. The key difference here is the one that deformed quickly, if you'll notice, 
ended ended up with much less strain when it failed compared to the one that uh, the one that deformed slowly. So if I were to look at the stress strain curves, the one that deformed quickly, you know, it rose up and didn't have very much plastic deformation before it broke. But the one that deformed slowly could deform a whole bunch before it broke here. And the key thing here is, you know, what's happening at the molecular level? Well, um, if we zoom in at the molecular level on what's happening for polyethylene, polyethylene is semi-crystalline in the sense that it has these regions of, of crystalline and then they're separated by regions of amorphous polymer here. Okay, amorphous, semi-crystalline. So when I attempt to pull apart when I attempt to pull apart this, this polymer with some force, the one that I deform quickly, I don't give these chains time to unpack. No time. No time to unpack. No time to unpack these crystals here. No time to even allow the amorphous regions to wiggle past one another that much. So what does that mean? Well, basically, if you can't unpack these polymers, then they just fracture. But for the one that had deformed very slowly, I gave these molecules enough time to sort of unwind, to uncoil, to unpack. And that basically means I uncoil rather than break. And, and in doing so, um, I get much more, much, more, uh, much more deformation before it fails. So by sort of examining what happens at the uh, at the atomic level, it turns out there are actually huge differences in terms of the properties that we have observed macroscopically. And you can imagine that um, when you're designing a plastic to be used in some application, for example, a bicycle helmet, when that bicycle helmet smashes against the ground, um, you want to consider not what the mechanical properties of the bicycle helmet foam is when it's being deformed slowly, you want to be able to predict, hey, how is this material going to deform, going to provide cushioning, going to uh, spread out and dissipate stress, going to decelerate the head and the brain slowly um, while that material is being deformed quickly during an impact. So this strain rate dependence has critical importance for the design of devices like helmets and shock absorbers um, and even modeling the behavior of like our tendons and ligaments and all, and all of that stuff. So, so we care a lot about um, viscoplastic effects as well as viscoelastic effects in order to sort of predict, hey, will the system break or will it deform a lot and then break? Um, and how, and you know, based on how quickly we deform it, can we make those predictions? So that's the, um, thus concludes our discussion of uh, visco, viscoplasticity. Now let's talk about viscoelasticity and what might be going on at the molecular level there. So for viscoelasticity, we'll basically split ourselves into two, um, two regions. Uh, we'll consider non-cross-linked polymers. So viscoelasticity. We'll consider two, two cases. One, we'll have non-cross-linked polymers. And then the other one will have cross-linked polymers. And for these non-cross-linked polymers, you might be thinking, um, for example, thermoplastics, uh, uncured thermosets, and uh, polymer chains that are not cross-linked, but dissolved in some kind of solvent like water. Um, and an example of that is the sort of viscoelastic fluid that, uh, that fills up our joints, um, synovial fluid, which sort of provides some, uh, some lubrication as well as essentially some cushioning um, in, our, in our joint space. So synovial fluid. fluid. So synovial fluid is something there. Cross-linked polymers um, are example cured thermosets, 
And if you remember the thermoset process is you start with a bunch of polymer chains, but then you form crosslinks, covalent crosslinks between these chains through some curing process, like by growing monomers, monomer bridges between the chains that polymerize to basically lock all of those chains together. So cured thermosets um, are, are one example. Also some hydrogels. Uh, now, granted, like, you know, these ones have a high density of crosslinks. These ones have a low density of crosslinks, but a lot of these hydrogels are basically still crosslinked to one another. They're these sort of loosely bound polymer networks, but they're still bound to one another covalently. There's just tons of water in between them. And we can basically get this viscoelastic effect either from chain chain interactions, um, you know, that are, that are sort of close, you know, close to one another, but not covalent, or just the viscosity of actual fluid surrounding the chains itself. So both of these can um, can sort of have some some situation. So first I'll consider what happens before deformation. So before before deformation, then we'll then we'll sort of consider what happens during deformation. And then we'll consider what happens um, after after the sort of force is removed. And we'll sort of well for each of these three cases, we'll imagine zooming in on the molecular level to see what's going on. So if we think about non-crosslinked polymers before deformation, we might just have like a bunch of randomly coiled uh, a bunch of sort of randomly coiled polymers. In a sense, that's what polyethylene looked like. Remember, these are only, the chains of polyethylene are not covalently bound to one another, but only loosely held to one another through these weak chain-chain interactions, weak but numerous chain-chain interactions. Compared to thermosets, we basically ha we might have ourselves in a situation where we sort of have, you know, it might look woven like this, but we actually have covalent bonds that bond that bond these chains to one another, and within the chains, you know, within you know between the cross links. There's sort of coiling, um, you know, between the crosslinks. So, um, so we sort of have these two cases here. Then, during the deformation, for these crosslinked polymers, I basically, I'm basically stretching out and sort of uncoiling what went on between the links. But you know, regardless of whether they're thermosets. Uh, where basically, you know, the chains, the chain, the, I can still have weak chain chain interactions in addition to these covalent ones or the hydrogels, you know, I'm applying this force and particularly for the hydrogels, the key thing about hydrogels is there might be fluid that sort of fills up all the interstices between, between these polymer chains. As I deform it, I need to squeeze that fluid out. So initially, kind of going from this step to this step, um, it behaves in a viscous way to basically squeeze fluid out. Until I've reached this point right here, and and once I've sort of stretched out the polymer coils enough, um, then the sort of springiness of the polymer network takes up the load. So then solid like spring behavior. Right here. And you know, anyone who's washed dishes, you know, you might have like a sponge or a cloth or something like that. You know, you can sort of pull or twist or squeeze a sponge to essentially wring out the fluid between the, the things in your sponge. And that's essentially what's going on here, just at a molecular level. We contrast this to uh, to these things over here, where once you start, where basically, and you know, initially you start deforming them, you basically take all of these polymer coils and stretch them out. So to go from this step to this step, it's it's almost solid-like behavior where you're stretching out the springs. And then once you've stretched out the springs, they can essentially flow past one another. 
much in the same way that fluid, you know, particles of fluid in the water flow past one another. So then after it's fluid-like flow. So for crosslink polymers, it's kind of, it sort of behaves almost like a fluid first and then a solid once the slack is taken up. And for crosslink polymers, it behaves almost like a solid first until those springs are uncoiled. And then we get fluid-like flow um, after here. Then what do we happen once we let go? This, cro the crosslink polymers sort of spring back. They spring back to their, you know, they contract back to their original shape. But in doing so, they need to draw fluid back in. So the and and in a sense, when we let go of the force and it's drawing fluid back in, that's the relaxation that occurs. And it basically takes time to relax from the stressed state to the relaxed state. It also takes time to go from its initial state to the stressed state. And sort of the characteristic times with which this with which these these processes occur are sort of the, the inherent time constant is something that's essentially a property of the viscoelastic. Um, essentially a property of the viscoelastic system. Similarly, um, relaxation also occurs in non-crosslink polymers, but in a slightly different way. This fluid-like flow basically stretched out, you know, stretched out all of these springs, but, you know, these springs want to essentially keep contracting back to their original state. Once you, once you let go, you know, once you, once you let go of that force that you're applying, these, uh, the springs can sort of snap back you know, can allow to allow to be recoiled in this sort of coiled configuration. So springs can basically recoil. Uh, recoil when when force removed. And this takes an amount of time. There's a characteristic time with which uh, it takes a stretched out polymer solution uh, to relax in this case. The key thing here, you know, that we consider for a lot of engineering applications is during this, during this stage, when we're applying the force, this, base, this material basically keeps deforming without bound. Basically, as long as I keep applying that force, the material keeps stretching and stretching and stretching until, you know, until the actual polymers themselves break or completely slip past one another. Um, and you know that has some interesting engineering applications. So you know, typically, if you're if you're thinking about what plastics to use, you don't want to use thermoplastics in applications where you're going to be applying a load to them constantly. So you know, these plastic bags last long enough for me to take the groceries from the car into the house, but I don't think I would hang heavy things in a plastic bag for a long amount of time because eventually that plastic bag would just sag and sag and sag and sag and eventually, you know, would either break or stretch all the way down to the floor or something silly like that. In contrast, these polymers with cross links, you know, uh, the, po the polymers themselves are covalently bound to one another so they can actually support load indefinitely. So these can support a constant load, um, you know, without permanent deformation or without, without sort of continuous, continuous deformation. So, um, so for different applications, you know, one or the other um, type of polymer might end up being appropriate, sort of considering what happens in the long term when we apply forces. So now that we've talked about what happens at the molecular level, let's now start talking about two viscoelastic models, um, which can essentially enable us to replace quote unquote messy behavior with sort of a simplified combination of springs and dash pots. So instead of, you know, instead of looking at what's happening here, can I say, hey, could I imagine that instead of, uh, instead of this complicated interaction between fluid and solid and polymer chains and all this stuff right here, can I just replace this as 
a chunk of solid and a chunk of fluid that each sort of behave like the ideal versions of themselves. And it turns out there are basically two ways that you can combine solid-like and fluid-like behavior together. One of them Kelvin Voigt and one of them Maxwell. And spoiler alert, one of them, you know, one of them works better for one of these situations and the other one works better for the other. So before we get too deep um, into the details of the Kelvin Voigt or the Maxwell models, let's now talk, uh, let's just take a step back, do a little bit of a refresher on the sort of high school or first year physics, where we'll talk about springs. If you remember, the more you stretch a spring, the more force it takes to do it. So you can imagine if there's some wall right here and a spring attached to the wall, and I pull on that spring with some force, the end of that spring is going to stretch out, you know, some, some distance, which, you know, if we sort of use the zero as our starting point, we could say, hey, the force, the force on this spring, according to Hooke's law, is equal to the spring constant k times x, which is basically the display, you know, the displacement of the end here. And you know, depending on exactly what direction you define this force, it could, you know, you could have a minus sign there or not. But you can kind of imagine spring force is basically proportional to its displacement, and k comes from a couple of factors. It comes from the modulus of elasticity of the material that makes up the spring, right? You know, if I make it out of steel, it's going to be different than if I make it out of plastic. Uh, but it also depends on, for example, like the geometry of the spring itself. Like, you know, what is its length? What is the thickness of the wire that makes it up? You know, etc. So it also, it depends not only on the material stiffness, but also on the spring geometry. I'm going to introduce a new uh, a new type of material where you know for anyone who's ever tried to swim or go in a boat or something like that you know the faster the faster you try to move through a fluid the more resistance you encounter when you're trying to move through that fluid and depending on what flow regime you in you're you're in um, that f your sort of resistance force ends up being directly proportional to how fast you're trying to move uh, to move through that. So uh, the sort of idealized uh, the an idealized device that recapitulates that effect is something called a dash pot. So so the idea with a dash pot, it's sort of it's schematic or its cartoon representation is this thing where there's sort of like a, a plate with a kind of a cup around it. And the idea with a dash pot is that its force is not proportional to how much you've stretched it, right? The more I stretch a spring, the more that force is. But the idea with a, force pot, uh, a dash pot is the force is proportional to how fast I'm deforming it. And there, we can basically characterize it with this constant b times uh, times the velocity of the uh, of the you know of the part that's moving. So times the velocity of the I don't know the plunger or the cup or you know or the end. So so springs you know, um, and if we if we sort of wanted to imagine this, you know, velocity is essentially the time derivative of position. So we could sort of say, hey, this is basically b times dx dt, where x is sort of the position of this endpoint. So dash pots don't care how much you've stretched them, but care only how fast you're stretching them. They only care about the velocity. And this, uh, this parameter b depends on the viscosity, the fluid's viscosity. And it also depends on uh, the geometry as well. So it depends both both on the fluid viscosity and the geometry. You can imagine, um, and so so basically, what this what what a physical dash pot actually looks like is essentially a cylinder with sort of a cup around the cylinder. And 
you know, the, cil the cylinder is attached to one rod, the cup is attached to another rod. These aren't solidly touching one another, but rather there's sort of fluid, some viscous fluid that fills the gap between them. And you can imagine the faster I try to pull that gap, the more I'm, you know, the more I'm stressing the, the fluid that, uh, that fits in between that gap. Um, so it's, you know, depends not only on the viscosity of the fluid, but also how narrow that gap is, you know, how long, how much contact area there is between the two, um, et cetera. So, um, so what are, you know, what are these viscoelastic models of some material? What you could imagine I could have a viscoelastic material right here. And if I pulled this viscoelastic material, in some ways it might behave like a dash pot where the faster I move it, the more force it requires. But in some ways it might behave like a spring where the amount that I've stretched it, you know, the, the more I've stretched it, the, um, the more force it takes. And depending on exactly how these, how the polymer chains within the viscoelastic material are linked, are cross-linked to one another or not, um, you know, depending on short-term or long-term time scales, it might behave more like a spring or more like a dash pot. And depending on whether I'm moving it quickly or moving it slowly, um, we might sort of have one effect dominate, the other effect dominate, or both effects be important depending on the time scale. And uh, we can sort of combine both of these effects together in, um, uh, in, vi in the two viscoelastic models that, uh, that we'll describe here. So the two, the two are Kelvin Voigt, uh, is a Kelvin Voigt model and a Maxwell model. And that is basically depending on sort of how you arrange springs and dash pots together, whether they sort of share the load or whether they share the displacement, um, the, uh, you end up with sort of different behavior that you observe phenomenologically. So let's now proceed with mathematically building up and physically arranging these components to describe the Kelvin Voigt and the Maxwell models. So the Kelvin Voigt model looks like, schematically looks like this below. So we have, we kind of imagine a block of material attached to the wall only instead of having a block of material occupy this space here, we simplify that material's behavior to a dash pot and a spring connected in parallel. So we basically, so we imagine, you know, one side of the material, basically if we stretch out the material like this in response, for example, to some force, some applied force, F applied. Um, for for the Kelvin, Kelvin Voigt model, we imagine that the displacements, you know, any displacement in the viscous behavior and in the spring-like behavior that they're sort of locked to one another. So there's basically one sort of single displacement. And if we imagine, if you sort of imagined, you know, if we almost imagined like a force balance of what's happening to this plate right here, We might say, hey, this overall force is applied like this, and pulling back on this plate is the force from the spring and the force from the dash pot as well. So basically, um, the force that it takes to deform the material is sort of split. So force is split. And, and if we imagine sort of both the spring and the dash pot attached to, to this material, material right here, um, the displacements are, uh, are locked together. So displacements are together. So if we think about, uh, if we think about this material, um, Take a moment now, pause and ponder. Um, as force is applied initially, so the like basically we can imagine imagine this is starting in the relaxed state, and then initially 
we apply this force. So as force is applied initially, um, which which of the effects dominate? The effect of the dash pot or the effect of the spring? Which dominates? So take a moment now, pause and ponder. One of these elements basically dominates the force initially. Well, uh, hopefully we've had a chance to pause and ponder. If we think about which force, um, when the force is applied initially, well, when the force is applied initially, the spring is not stretched. And when the force is applied initially, if the spring is not stretched at all, it's essentially this is not contributing contributing anything to the effect. So initially, the force, all of the force is basically um, accounted for by the dash pot or the viscous effect. So basically, there's no spring force. So there's no spring force initially. And so that means it's all viscous effect. Take a moment now, pause and ponder. As time goes to infinity, i.e. after we've been applying this force for a very, very, very long time, which effect dominates? Well, perhaps you've thought of it by, by process of elimination. As time goes to infinity, basically the spring is fully stretched out. And by fully, I mean full, uh, the, the spring basically gets stretched out so much that it balances with the force, with the applied force. So spring gets fully stretched. So that means no force is needed from the dash pot. And if no force is needed from the dash pot, take a moment, pause and ponder now. As time goes to infinity, what happens to the velocity? essentially the velocity of the point that we're trying to stretch out here. Well, thinking if the spring is fully stretched, it's not moving anymore. And sort of con uh, consistent with that, if no more force is, is, you know, if all of the force gets taken up by the spring, once the spring gets stretched out, and no more force is needed from the dash pot, and we return to these ideas here of this dash pot, if there's no more force in the dash pot, and that basically means there's no more velocity of this system here. So basically, what happens to velocity? That basically means velocity approaches zero as time goes to infinity. So take a moment now, pause and ponder. Create a sketch of what, uh, of what you think, uh, sketch what you think the position, let's say x, x is going to be as a function of time. So sketch x as a function of time if we if our force versus time looks like this. So imagine as a function of time, I'm basically not applying any force, not applying any force, not applying any force. Then at time equals zero, I very I, it's, I, it's like I basically very suddenly apply some force to start moving it. So this right here, so this is my force applied. So take a moment now, add to this sketch. I know the y-axis sort of counts for position and sort of counts for force, but just just to sort of coordinate the two, you know, add to this add to this plot what you think what you think um, x versus time looks like. Well, uh, before we've applied the force, we basically don't have any displacement, right? You know, this, this thing's not moving until I apply any force to it. Initially, before I've stretched out the spring very much, 
the thing the 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 material behaves sort of just like a dash pot right before the spring is stretched out this is basically just like a dash pot so in that case um, my velocity at, so at the start my velocity is approximately constant and because it's just like a dash pot And of course, uh, and of course, velocity is essentially the slope of a displacement versus time curve. But as time goes to infinity, velocity goes to zero. And when velocity goes to zero, I've basically taken this system out and stretched it out to a certain level. So, so what does that mean? It basically goes like this, and there's essentially a an x, a sort of steady state. A steady state uh, displacement. So it basically, we start off with essentially some initial velocity, and then this thing sort of, you know, rises up, and then eventually kind of plateaus, where you know now velocity is equal to zero, where where, where you essentially no longer have any rising slope in our position, our position versus time graph. And what I've described right here, which is basically if you apply no force and then all of a sudden you, your force sort of jumps up to some constant level, this type of experiment is what we call a creep test. Where basically we have no force, we then all of a sudden apply some known constant force and we measure what x of t looks like. what x of t looks like. And it turns out that depending on the shape of this curve, you can actually infer the properties of the Kelvin, the Kelvin Voigt model. So if you remember, our spring basically has some k. Our dash pot has some, some b. And it turns out that you can actually infer k and b from this, uh, from the from the shape of this curve right here. So take a moment now. How might, how might you get k from this curve? So pause and ponder. So how to get k? How do we get k from, from this curve right here? Well, hopefully you've had a chance to think about it. Basically, once, once, we've, once we're, if we ignore what happens initially, once we're in this plateaued region, the steady state displacement, you know, the, the, the effect of the dash part goes away. So K, uh, so K is essentially equal to the, the uh, sorry, the force, sorry about that, the applied force divided by the steady state, the steady state displacement, right? If f equals kx, when we're in this plateau, if f of the spring equals kx, but when we're in the plateaued region, the spring force is totally equal with the force applied because we don't have a dash pot effect anymore, then the k is essentially given like this. Take a moment now, pause and ponder how to get b. Well, hopefully you've had a chance. Uh, hopefully you've had a chance to think about it. It turns out we can use this initial slope, so we could basically say b is equal to uh, the force applied divided by dx dt um, the initial the sort of initial dx dt right right at this right at this region here. So, you know, th these are sort of uh, approximate ways to get k and b. It turns out the act you can actually derive uh, you can actually derive the shape of this curve, and um, and this curve basically ha ha is of the form x steady state times one minus e to the minus um, 
t over some time constant, capital T. And capital T depends on the properties of this system. More, specific, more specifically, this time constant for the system, I'll call it, let's say capital T sys, is basically just equal to, uh, ends up being equal to b, b over k. So, uh, so you know, there are a couple, a couple of ways, you know, that you could basically use this. You could essentially curve, you could do curve fitting. You know, if you had a bunch of data, you could curve fit this curve to this, to these data. And then, you know, from your x steady state and your time constant of your system, calculate it this way. Or you could just look at what's happening at the plateau, just look at what's happening in the, uh, in the initial region and estimate your k and b that way. So to, to sort of jump ahead a little bit, this is based, so you can basically use a creep test to figure out the parameters for a Kelvin Voigt model. Let's now talk about the Maxwell model. Oh, sorry. No, I forgot one important thing. For the Kelvin Voigt model, take a moment now, pause and ponder. Which of these materials here, cross-linked uh, cross polymers or non-cross-linked polymers, do you think is best described with a Kelvin Voigt model? Well, hopefully if you had a chance to pause and ponder, cross-linked polymers uh, are the ones that are best described, described by Kelvin Voigt. And, and why is that? Well, you can imagine basically it's these cross links, you know, the cross links prevent, you know, pre like it basically initially behaves sort of like a liquid as we're trying to squeeze all of the fluid out from in between the materials or the weak chain chain bonds of the material makes it behave sort of liquid like. Um, but once we've squeezed it all out, then the polymer chains become taut and it can support, uh, it can support a constant load without, for, without permanent deformation. You know, that's essentially what we would have right here. And this recoil effect, as you can imagine, if I stretched out the spring with this force, when I let go, that uh, that spring would basically want to pull this material, pull this material back. So we can essentially get this refoil. So Kelvin Voigt is basically what's most consistent with cross-linked polymers. All right, now let's move on to the Maxwell model for real this time. So what is the Maxwell model? Well, uh, it too involves one spring and one dash pot, but instead of being in parallel, as with Kelvin Voigt, they're basically in series. So. Our applied force might be like this. And basically, as this applied force is going, if I were to sort of examine each of these in isolation, you know, I'm applying my applied force right here and here. Both of these are essentially a, the same applied force. And, you know, whatever for whatever, if I look at this point right here, whatever force the dash pot is being pulled with, you know, pulled back by the spring is also the same, the, sp the same force that the spring is applying to the dash pot, right? Dash pot. This is right. This is essentially Newton's third law right here. So actually all, you know, all of these, all of these forces here and here and here and here, they're all essentially the applied force. So the idea with this Maxwell model is the force is sort of transmitted through the liquid phase and through the solid phase, you know, sort of, um, all, all through one another, all forces involved are this applied, whatever applied force we have right here. But um, if you imagine as I'm applying this applied force, 
I can basically get some amount of displacement from the spring. You know, the, the spring basically gets some, some change in length and the dash plot gets some change in length and their individual displacements, they're not necessarily equal to each other. and they add up to the overall uh, system displacement. They add up to the overall system, right? So basically if this end, you know, if I, if I stretch out this end one meter, that the one meter that this end stretches out, some of that one meter comes from stretch in the spring, some of that one meter of stretch comes from uh, comes comes from you know sliding of the dash pot, um, and overall they add up. So essentially, the, there are individual displacements that add up to the overall displacement, and there's one force that goes between the two, uh, or, or that sort of goes sorry that goes through the whole system. And, in, and of course, we contrast this to Kelvin Voigt. For Kelvin Voigt, the displacements were the same, but the forces were split. The forces were different. So for Kelvin Voigt. One overall force gets split between the two phases, the solid phase and the liquid phase. Um, for Maxwell, there's one force that's transmitted through, you know, that's the same for both phases. For Kelvin Voigt, there's one single displacement. Whatever displacement the liquid experiences also sort of needs to be experienced by the solid phase. For Maxwell, there's some displacement in the, that, uh, that sort of is accounted for by liquid and some that's accounted for by solid and they're not necessarily the same as each other. So, uh, so, so that's the deal here. And if you, so if we, um, so if you think about this, this Maxwell, um, this Maxwell model, you can also do, um, you can also sort of answer some of the same questions that we did, um, uh, that we that we also so you know uh, so we can't really describe what forces dominate right because the forces are the same for both but we can anticipate what a creep test might look like for this material so take a moment now pause and ponder what would the the sort of system displacement x of t look like for a creep test for this material. And so, so what do I mean if we had, as a function of time, if at time equals zero, I basically had zero, zero force right here. Then all of a sudden I apply, I apply a sudden force to the whole system What's that going to look like? So take a moment now, pause and ponder, sketch what you think the displacement versus time of the, of the whole system is going to look like. Well, hope you've had a chance to pause and ponder. If we think about it, as if I apply this force, you know, it's essentially, it's essentially what would happen if I applied this force to this system, and then also what would happen if I applied this force to this system, and then added those two up later on. We can essentially sort of superimpose the displacements. So if I suddenly apply a force to a spring, well, you know, initially I apply zero force, so I'm not going to have any displacement in my system. If I then suddenly apply a force, that force goes through the spring, that spring is going to nearly instantly stretch out. So basically the spring nearly instantly stretches out. And this is basically, this is from the spring. The spring basically stretches out very quickly. And then I can sort of consider what happens in the dash plot. Will I apply some force to the dash plot? If I apply a force to a dash plot, it gets constant velocity. And if I imagine constant velocity, that's essentially an, an x versus time curve that sort of has a constant positive slope. So it's gonna, my x of t is essentially going to look like this, where what happens here is from the dash pot. So if you have these Maxwell materials, they basically initially stretch out due to an elastic effect. And then over time, 
they continue to sort of stretch out almost as if they were um, a very viscous liquid. So take a moment now, pause and ponder. How do we, how to extract the B and K from, from these data, from this data? Well, if we, we can sort of just look at these effects in isolation from one another, right? If we sort of look at just the spring factor, there's basically some initial delta X, right? There's some sort of like delta X initial that basically jumps up from the K. So, so we can basically say, hey, based on this initial delta X, this initial delta X, um, whatever force we're applying, our force applied, divided by that initial delta x um, essentially gives us our k, right? Because f equals kx. If I, it just, in the very short term, this, this the, the initial displacement until, until this, uh, until the dash plot has had a long time to sort of stretch and stretch and stretch and continuously stretch and stretch and stretch, the, that initial displacement is dominated just by the spring that's that's basically what it looks like here. So I can essentially get the k by looking at what the initial displacement is, and then in the long term, I can essentially measure the slope is basically equal to the the steady state, the steady state velocity, and of course I can relate that to b. So b is essentially equal to whatever force. I apply divided by the steady state, the steady state velocity. So that's how we can get k and b from uh, from from data. Of course, I mean I think it'd be pretty obvious by process of elimination, non-cross-linked polymers like thermoplastics and uncured thermosets and synovial fluid. These might be best described by uh, Maxwell. And of course, you know, for a thermoplastic, I mean, thermo, like for us in our everyday lives, these thermoplastics appear like, you know, essentially appear to be solids. So, you know, here I, I sort of describe like some initial displacement and some slope where, you know, they both might appear very similar to one another. You know, a thermoplastic might have such a small slope, right? And act a solid like thermoplastic has a small but non-zero slope. Right? And and maybe a large initial displacement like this, right? So so you know thermoplastics, you know, even like more solid like thermoplastics might sort of have mostly an elastic effect and only a very small viscous effect. Whereas maybe something like synovial fluid, you know, behaves very much like a liquid. It might have virtually, it would have virtually no initial displacement, but might have, you know, might sort of have a, a very, you know, a lot of, uh, a very large slope associated with its sort of viscous effect. So, um, you know, so diff, you know, even though I sort of am, am lumping all of these together, it's mostly the difference, it's not the difference in the sort of inherent model that works best for these, but rather a difference in the parameters in that for, you know, for synovial fluid, um, you know, we, we, we get no, you know, very little displacement in a large slope. For thermoplastics, we get maybe a large initial displacement in a small slope. Um, but fundamentally, they can sort of both be modeled in this viscoelastic framework. So that concludes our discussion of Kelvin, Kelvin Voigt models and Maxwell models in terms of like how they're defined and how they're useful, right? These can allow us to predict behavior, right? We can basically say, hey, if I were to, ha if I were to put a bunch of weights in my shopping bag, you know, in that plastic shopping bag that I had earlier, if I were to put a bunch of weight in that, you know, this would tell you how, how far that plastic bag is going to sag 
initially once I put those weight in that weight in and if I were to wait some amount of time these visco this viscoelastic model would allow you to predict just how how long that bag you know or how, how much that bag is going to sag you know every week every month every year something like that so for uh, so with a with a creep test you could actually sort of extrapolate those to sort of to predict in the long term what the system behavior is going to be and you know for example for a kelvin voigt model um, we might and we might be able to use that type of data to basically predict how long it's going to take you know if i if i apply some stress to for example like a, a crosslink collagen tendon um, you know that might basically allow us to predict like how long is that how, you know how long is that tendon going to take in order to sort of get fully displaced to its kind of steady state amount something like that so both so you know both of these models are useful for different materials and they're both useful in terms of a biophysics as well as a uh, an engineering analysis sort of application now one last thing i wanted to talk about is an alternative way to gather parameters to the creep test is essentially the stress relaxation test which is basically um, so so creep test so creep was basically prescribe a sudden jump in your force and then observe uh, displacement versus time. The alternative to that is instead of prescribing a constant force, for example, like having a chunk of material and hanging a weight, you know, hanging a weight on it, and then at time equals zero, letting the weight, you know, letting the weight go, so the weight just causes the material to sag. Instead of prescribing a constant force, like hanging a weight on something, we can instead do stress relaxation. which is the alternative to a creep test, and you basically prescribe a sudden jump in displacement, and then you observe or measure the force as a function of time. So, you know, so what would, what would a stress relaxation test look like? Well, a stress relaxation test might look something like this. If I had, uh, if I had a piece of material, let's say for example, let's say for example this tape right here. Ah, so that's a little hard to see. Hold on, I'll get something better. All right, back with a piece of plastic bag. So a creep test is basically I have this piece of plastic bag. I'm, I, I'm hanging a weight on it, and then at time equals zero, I let that weight go, so the weight prescribes some constant force, Then, and I'm measuring how much it sags versus time. Stress relaxation, in contrast, is I have, my, I have my plastic bag. At time equals zero, I give it some very rapid initial displacement. I, you know, I basically go, and stretch it out, and then as time goes on, uh, you know, I'm, 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 my machine is basically holding, you know, holding that motion, holding that motion, holding that prescribed deformation. In the material and within my fingers you know imagine instead of my fingers doing this I had clamps within one of the clamps I have a force sensor that's measuring how much force was required to accomplish that task as time goes on so you can prescribe prescribe one and then measure the other and depending on which you do it's crease creep versus stress relaxation so let's take a moment now and think about how stress relaxation uh, might look. What you know, what your expected force versus time might look like for uh, for the two. So let's do so. Let's do a um, cross-linked and imagine that it's uh, that this is Kelvin Voigt. And non-cross-linked, 
and this would be Maxwell. So take a moment now, pause and ponder, sketch what you, what you might think as a function of time. Again, remember we're measuring force, force versus time. Force, force versus time. Take a moment now, sketch what you think these two look like if we've essentially prescribed a, 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 a sudden jump in our displacement versus time. So again, our displacement versus time, you know, initially it's it's not stretched out at all. At time equals zero, we go and stretch it out very suddenly. So again, this is our X prescribed as a function of time for each of these. And, and for both of these, you know, for both of these, what I'm talking about right here, both of these are, are what, uh, what this new test that I'm describing here, the stress relaxation. So if you remember the cross-linked Kelvin Voigt model is basically the dash plot and the spring translating together attached to a solid wall. So the tricky thing here is um, during this during this sudden you know this sudden motion right here, um, this is essentially infinite velocity. Right, and in order to basically take this dash pot and you know instantly stretch it out with an infinite velocity, the force that I'm measuring actually right at this moment goes up to infinity. So basically, force goes to infinity. I, I sort of get this huge spike, this huge spike. So force spike. So an infinite, an infinite force spike. Right here, you know, essentially required required to move this dash plot at infinite velocity. But then, and then once I've stretched it out all the way, you know, my spring is basically stretched out. So then, at that point, this force just kind of levels off, levels off to some level, where basically the force would essentially be equal to k times my x prescribed. So is this, you know, is this that useful of a test? Well, you know, I don't know about you, but there aren't really hardly any measurement tools out there that can withstand infinite infinite force, um, or or there aren't really any measurement tools that can essentially measure an infinite force while while they're being stretched. So typically, uh, so stress relaxation tests are not super useful, um, not really useful for this. Not super useful for characterizing Kelvin void materials because essentially you, you you can't really measure anything about the viscous effect at all because it's sort of making that entire thing happen in this infinite force spike. So just forget about it. Um, alternatively, we have this uh, this um, uh, stress relaxation test for a Maxwell model, and that's actually um, you know that's actually a pretty good test. We can actually get useful data for this. So imagine I'm, I'm taking force versus time. Well, initially, before the x is prescribed, I don't need any force to hold that. Then at time equals 0, well, remember what this looks like. I'm stretching this out. So basically, at time equals 0, At time equals zero, if you imagined I stretched this on out, at time equals zero, all of that stretch is basically taken up by the spring. So this hasn't moved at all, but the spring 
the spring gets stretched out. You know, all, all of the displacement gets taken up by the spring. All of the X taken up by spring. Um, and then if you and if you can imagine, okay, if all of that X is taken up by the spring, you know, this really hasn't had a chance to move at all. That's when essentially my force is going to be maximized. So at time equals zero, I basically jump up to some to some max, you know, almost instantaneously as the spring stretches out instantaneously to a maximum force. But as time goes on, my dash pot, you know, gradually sort of extends. as the spring contracts. So spring contracts as dash pot expands. And as that spring contracts, less and less and less, as that spring contracts, less and less and less and less force is required to maintain that stretch until eventually the dash pot sort of gets all the way extended and the spring contracts back to its total rest length. So what does that mean? Basically, at time equals zero, the spring gets max maximum stretch. And as the spring contracts, this force gradually tapers off, tapers off, tapers off, tapers off, tapers off, tapers off, tapers off. And if you were to sort of model this mathematically, this ends up being exponential decay in force. So we have some, some initial maximum force that can be used to calculate the k of the spring. And it turns out that like the rate at which this decays is, is related to B and K, which can which allows you to determine the B of this dash plot. So what's so what's the deal with stress relaxation? Well, sorry to deprive you to deprive you of some useful relaxation at the end of this stressful lecture. <laughs> but um, but it's not very useful for Kelvin Voigt. But you know, like this is pretty useful data, right? This is this isn't an infinite spike here. It's a finite spike, which is k times the x prescribed. Um, it is useful. It is useful for this. So so basically, you know, what is this force? This force, this initial force. This initial force is would basically be equal to the k. The k of the material times the x prescribed. And this exponential decay, right? This is essentially f of t is basically equal to the f initial times e to the minus t over t of the system, where the t of the system for this one actually ends up having sort of the same expression as the other one. The t of the system is equal to, um, sorry, is equal to. is equal to b over k. So basically you use your you use this you figure out this initial force to figure out k cuz you would know your x prescribed and you'd me have measure you'd you'd measure that first data point there and then this the time of then then once you once you figured out this exponential decay you can then uh, use all that information to figure out b. So non for non cross-linked materials um, a stress relaxation test can be useful, um, but you know creep tests. Creep tests allow you to creep tests. Creep tests work with both, right? A creep test can allow us to fit the parameters for Kelvin Voigt um, and for Maxwell, whereas stress relaxation only really super only really super useful for Maxwell. So, thus concludes our discussion. We talked about viscoplasticity in terms of how. Uh, in terms of a connection between the uh, what's going on at the molecular level and how that affects stress strain curves and how we can get radically different apparent stress strain curves depending on how quickly we deform molecules. We talked about two viscoelastic models, Kelvin Voigt, which was basically best for uh, for cross-linked polymers. And the Maxwell model, which is best for non-cross-linked polymers.
And for each of these, and for each of these, we described what the displacement versus time or the force versus time curves might look like and how we could potentially extract parameters from those curves to fit to these models. So thank you very much for your attention and good luck with your study of biomaterials.